Our scripture today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 31. And uh, we're, we're talking about Saul in, in the context here. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. We're going to talk today about being a Barnabas. Barnabas is not a real well-known person and Because of time, we're not going to do a complete character study of him, but we're going to look at him in this context and a a few others. But we have a problem. This passage starts out with a problem. Saul's returning to Jerusalem. Now, it doesn't say so in this passage, but in in Galatians, it says this is about three years after his conversion. He He comes to Jerusalem, and no doubt he wanted to see some of his old friends Because he had been a Pharisee, he wanted to tell them about Jesus. He wanted to convince some of these staunch Jews that were friends of his about Jesus. But they had heard how he had defected from Judaism, and so they didn't want anything to do with him. And then he really wanted to be with the followers of Jesus. But they still had vivid memories of his vicious persecution, along with Stephen's death, and they were very cautious. If you remember, Saul was the one there giving approval for the stoning of Stephen. So then he comes back about three years later, and they're like, well, I don't know if I want anything to do with him. And can you understand why they might have that feeling? They may have some grudges of, hey, Stephen was my best friend. Uh... I don't care what you say Jesus did in your heart. Uh, I'm not so sure. I don't, you're not my kind of person. Or they might think he's just trying to come in here and pretend to be a Christian so that he can, you know, figure out what's going on, kind of as a spy. Who knows what they were thinking, but there's lots of reasons why they were rejecting Saul, who, again, is the Apostle Paul. Uh, later on, he gets, he gets called Paul more. So they were afraid of him, and they didn't believe he was a disciple. But there's a a verse here. Verse 27 says, but Barnabas. (laughs) But Barnabas. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas takes up his case. His name, Barnabas, means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. And so Barnabas basically sticks his neck out for Saul and says, hey, he's he's okay. So the first thing we see about Barnabas is he's trustworthy in relationships. He's trustworthy in relationships. He was an encour- encourager. If we look back a couple, a, a couple chapters, uh, actually in chapter 4, verse 36, it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So he sold a field he owned, put it at the apostles' feet for the church, an act of encouragement. He had already led the way. He had kind of paid the dues in his relationships with the church, and they knew he was a solid guy. 
<clears throat> have you met people who you know that you can just count on them? You know, this person, in fact, it's kind of like, well, if you're a friend of so-and-so's, okay, I'm going to consider you a friend of mine. That's basically what Barnabas did right here. He said, if, if, you're a, if Saul is a friend of Barnabas, all right, all right, he can, he can come and worship with us. We'll accept him. But you have to be trustworthy in relationships to do that. Because I'm sure we know other people who you say, yeah, they, it is a friend of theirs, but I'm not so sure. They don't always make the best choices, and so I don't know. Yeah, they're vouching for so-and-so, but the person that they vouch for isn't like it seems. And it may be that they don't know, or that it just doesn't bother them, but Barnabas wasn't that kind of person. He knew Saul well enough to know his story. We see here he tells him what had happened. So he had spent enough time with Saul to say, hey, I understand what's going on. And he really is a disciple. And he knew the apostles and they trusted him enough to say, okay. So he was trustworthy in relationships. The second thing we see is he was courageous. He was courageous enough to get to know Saul, which... You know, here's somebody who had put Christians to death. The easy thing, the safest thing to do is always nothing, right? I don't care what situation you're in, the safest thing to do is always nothing. But usually the worst thing to do is nothing. So it would have been easy for him just to say, okay, I'm going to just stay away. Let him, you know, let somebody else prove him. But no. Barnabas took the initiative and he got to know Saul's story. We don't know exactly how, but he had to spend time with him to hear his story, what happened. And so he was courageous enough to approach a persecutor of the church and get to know his story. He was also courageous enough to bring him to the apostles. Because what if they would have said, hey, if you're with him, we don't want anything to do with you. You know, we don't like him. And if you're with him, you're out too. That's always a risk. But he was courageous enough to say, hey, I'm going to bring him. I'm going to present him. I'm going to make a case for him. And they accepted him. The third thing, and these all kind of work together, is he was discerning. Discerning. And if you're trying to fill out your handout, that's not a word we use a lot. It's D-I-S-C-E-R-N-I-N-G. Discerning. <clears throat> he had spiritual discernment. He was able to get God's perspective on whether or not Saul's conversion was genuine. Some people are very friendly, but they're a little bit naive. They lack discernment. But Barnabas was able to spot a fake, and he... He knew what was, what was real. Have you ever met somebody and, you know, they've got a good story and it sounds good and they say, you know, I'm, I've accepted Jesus, I'm on board, but then they don't last? Or maybe somebody has an addiction problem or has some kind of a commitment problem and they say, I'm going to really do it this time. I'm really going to do it this time. Should you believe them? That's a tough question, is it? isn't it? That's where discernment comes in. Because sometimes yes and sometimes no. And you have to be able to know the difference. And you get a sense, which Barnabas had, of... This, this person's for real. Now, Barnabas didn't know what was going to happen the rest of his life, but he knew that Paul was for real here. Saul was for real. He could spot a fake. So be discerning. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who they're going to call themselves Christian, and you're going to find out that what they believe isn't the same as what you believe. Everybody likes to put a tag on whatever they do as a Christian movement or something like this. But that doesn't necessarily even mean that they believe in Jesus. So we have to be cautious. There's lots of 
cults out there, lots of movements that aren't really biblical. And so Barnabas knew the difference. The fourth thing we see about Barnabas is he was persuasive. He was persuasive. He was persuasive to the disciples. He made his case. And they accepted it. We don't see here where they even really questioned it too much. He had that ability to say something and say it meaningfully enough that people said, okay, I, I got it. He was also persuasive to Saul. If we look at the end of this, this chapter here, um, let me get back to that chapter. Um, <clears throat> or the end of this passage. He talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the brothers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. I'm assuming Barnabas was one of those who helped move Paul out of Jerusalem to save his life. <clears throat> Paul thought he was the perfect guy, or Saul at this, at this time. He knew everything that, that the people there knew. He had been one of the people that was coming after the church. And he thought, you know what? I've accepted Jesus. God has put me in this perfect situation. But it wasn't so perfect. And it wasn't God's will. Have you ever had a thing in your life where it looked really, really perfect and then it fell through? God had something else, something better. For, for Saul, it was to reach the rest of the world, essentially. To go to the Gentiles and reach the rest of the world. But I imagine it took some persuading for him to move elsewhere. He thought, no, I got, I got a good ministry here. He was arguing with the Grecian, Grecian Jews, and he was winning the arguments. But who else won arguments with the Grecian Jews? If you remember a few weeks ago, Stephen. How did it go for him? And so Barnabas was able to, you know, we can just kind of imagine, go up and say, hey, buddy. We got to get you out of here. We can't lose you. Yeah, you're winning the arguments and you're good at it, but we can't lose you. We got to get you out of here. And so they persuade, he persuaded, along with others, Saul to move out of Jerusalem for his own safety. And it's almost comical here that after Saul leaves, we have this passage. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Would you like to have that said about you? After you left, the church had a good time. The church was fine. That was said about Paul, Saul, because he was in, in many ways a divisive figure, not because he was had anything negative, but just because he was so, so focused, so zealous for Jesus that it was a little too much and it was going to get him killed. And so when they were able to send him off, God blessed the church and they had a time of peace and joy. We don't know exactly if it was because Paul left, but it seems kind of like a coincidence here that, you know, <clears throat> After he left, everything was wonderful. A couple other things I want to point out about Barnabas. <clears throat> we often don't hear of him very much. If somebody asks you who the Apostle Paul is, you pretty much know, right? If somebody says, who's Barnabas? What did he do? I don't know. The thing about Barnabas, he traveled with Saul. <clears throat> he, was, he was Paul's companion for a good part of his missionary journey. And he was probably at least as wise and as persuasive and knew as much. He had been a Christian longer. But he was humble enough to, take the, the set, to be the second place guy, to be the number two guy. He didn't have to get the glory. He didn't have to be, because we see here where Barnabas speaks and he preaches. 
Everything, every indication was he was on par with the Apostle Paul. He's even called an apostle later on. <clears throat> but he's so humble that he, he didn't want the limelight. He was able, and one needed to be, he could speak and he could be persuasive and he could do all of these things. But he was, he was very comfortable in being Saul's, later Paul's, encourager. Don't we need people like that? I mean, if you know a little bit about the Apostle Paul, basically his life is go into a city, get beat up, thrown out, left for dead, wake up, dust yourself off, go into another city, get beat up, get tossed out of the city, be left for dead, dust yourself off, get back up, go into another city, preach about Jesus, get kicked out. <laughs> I imagine he needed some encouragement, right? And Barnabas was right there with him. You know, he probably got beat up sometimes too. But since he was the number two guy, you know, maybe he didn't get quite all of it. And he would say, hey, come on. Get back. You can do it. You can do it. I, I mean, I can only imagine the struggles that Saul had. And we know that he had a physical problem. He tells us in Galatians. Uh, we don't know what it was. But after being beat up and left for dead that many times, it's not hard to imagine that he had some struggles and some aches and pains, left in prison and all these kind of things. He needed somebody. And I can't imagine, I mean, he was human, just like you and I. It's hard when people hate you, even if they're hating you for loving Jesus, right? I don't know if you've ever been really hated by somebody, but that's tough. It beats you up inside. It tears you apart inside. And sometimes you start to wonder if maybe they're right. You know, maybe I am whatever they think. Maybe my critics are right in some ways. And boy, it can be really defeating and really difficult. But Barnabas was there to say, hey, buddy, you're on track. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. Keep going. We got, we got a whole world to reach for Jesus. Keep going. Don't let them get to you. We don't know all of the things that Barnabas whispered in his ear, but he was an encourager. Even when God sends Paul out in a couple chapters, we'll see, he sends Barnabas with him because he knew that he would need that encouragement. Barnabas was satisfied with that role. He was son of encouragement and he was an encourager in many ways. And you know, there's those people in our lives that are pluses and there's those people in our lives that are minuses, right? You know, there's the negative people who tend to suck the air out of a room. <laughs> and then there's those positive people who, when they show up, it just lights up the room. And so for a, a personal application, and this gets really personal. I'm not going to apologize for it, but it gets really personal. Think about the three or four people closest to you. Those people who know you, who you live with. Maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your coworkers. The three or four people who are very closest to you. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your parents. Ask yourself a question. Would they say that I am an encourager? Would they say that I am an encourager? Are you a Barnabas? Are you somebody who makes a difference? I've had those people in my life and I still have those people in my life who just, they just keep you going. They know the right thing to say at the right time to just keep you going. And those, encourage, those encouragers, they make a big difference. They don't get a lot of glory. A lot of times nobody else really knows. Sometimes it's pretty quiet. And you might say, well, I'm not, I'm not an upfront kind of person, but you know what? Anyway, 
any of us can be an encourager, right? And I think we have to make a choice. A lot of times daily. Because I don't know about you, but it's easier for me to see the negative things than the positive things. It's easier to see all the things that are going to go wrong or all the things that so-and-so does wrong than it is to see the things that are going right. So I think we have to constantly make a daily choice to say, hey, yeah, I'm not going to ignore the negative things, but you know what? I'm going to find something good. Have you had those people who maybe believe in you more than you even believe in yourself? That's a Barnabas. That's a Barnabas. Somebody who says, yeah, you can do it. And you're saying, I don't know. I'm not so sure. Yeah, you can do it. I know you can do it. And you trust them enough because of the relationship, because of their discernment, that you say, okay, well, if you say that I can do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out. Because I might not even trust myself a whole lot right now, but I, I trust your view of me. I trust your assessment. I trust your wisdom to say that if you think I can do it, I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to do it. That's what it means to be a Barnabas. And so I want to encourage you, each one of us, every one of us has the opportunity to be a Barnabas to somebody, and essentially to be a Barnabas to everyone we meet. I don't care if, the, if it's the cashier at the grocery store. Are you an encourager or a discourager? Are you the person who complains about the line? Or are you the person who says something or just gives a smile and makes that person just this much happier? Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you and we thank you that Jesus is the greatest encourager of all. Lord, you love us more than we can imagine. Lord, you, you call us into things that are beyond our abilities and you encourage us. Jesus, we want to be like you in this way. And Lord, we want to be like Barnabas, who gave us an example. Lord, help us to be an encourager to those around us in the faith. Lord, take our, our eyes off the negative things and make us strong in encouraging others. We, we ask for this, Lord, and we ask that this would change our hearts and change our, our character. And Lord, let us be a church full of encouragers. We pray for that in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.